2020 to order. And Sandy, at this time, could we have a roll call, please? Council Member Shippers? Here. Ellen Boss? Ellen Boss? He's muted. He said he's put, holding his finger up and saying here, but he's muted. Okay, Ingalls? Here. King? Here. Mayor Falcons? Here. Here. Okay, if we could have a motion to approve the agenda, we do have a, an, amenda, an amended agenda this evening, if someone would like to make that motion. This is Council Member Shippers. I will make a motion to approve the agenda to, um, let's see, add a resolution increasing the number of members of the Corridor Improvement Authority Board under adoption of ordinances and resolutions. Ellen Boss will second. Council Member Ellen Boss? Yes. Ingalls? Yes. King? Yes. Shippers? Yes. Mayor Falcon? Yes. Motion carries. This time we'll open the floor for the first public comment. Not seeing or hearing anyone, we'll close public comment and move to the approval of the consent agenda. And this evening, we do have the minutes from our regular meeting on October 5th, along with the minutes from our closed <coughs> session on the 5th of October. I would make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented, Ellen Boss. Support Go ahead. Councilmember Ingalls? Yes. King? Yes. Shippers? Yes. Alba? Yes. Mayor Falcons? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, so this evening on our agenda, we do have um, a community spotlight and this evening, we would like to be able to recognize the years of service of some of our volunteer boards and commission members. Uh, normally, we like to get together once a year and bring the volunteers together for um, some social time and fellowship, but this year is a little bit different. So um, I'd like to be able to share this information with everyone tonight, and then also um, we'll finalize all of these things um, by providing a certificate to each of these volunteers. So this year, this year we do have um, some five and even 35 year awards to be uh, announced. The first one is Tom Olmstead, who has served on our cemetery board and he being recognized for five years of service. Uh, Troy Knight, is being recognized for his serve, service on the Zoning Board of Appeals, and he has been serving for 15 years. Sherry Alt has been serving on the same Zoning Board of Appeals for 15 years as well. And Curtis Schultz is on the Downtown Development Authority, and he has been serving on that authority for 20 years. And then finally, Tim Coffey, who has also been serving on the Downtown Development Authority, and he has been serving on that authority for 35 years. And um, as always, a huge thank you to all of our volunteers that make up our different uh, committees and authorities. Uh, it's what makes our city run as well as it does. And so I would like to just say thank you um, as part of that community spotlight. And Mayor, certainly uh, thank you to you as well. Uh, as of December of last year, you've, you've had five years um, uh, on council. 
Um, and that's it's also noted in the communication of that milestone. And I just wanted to say that for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> all of that being said, that takes us to the city manager's report this evening. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of council. And, and I also wanted to add that we're, we have reached out to all of the volunteers that have hit milestones, uh, and we will be letting them know when to come in to uh, pick up their certificates. Um, uh, so again, thank you, uh, Mayor and members of the City Council. The first item under the manager's report this evening is with respect to uh, our police rifle replacement program. Uh, recently, we requested bids uh, to replace the current rifles deployed in uh, departmental operations and to purchase additional equipment uh, to be assigned to each officer in the department. Uh, bids came in uh, from three uh, different vendors, uh, Keisler Police Supply, CMP Distributors, and Michigan Police Equipment uh, Company. Uh, uh, Keisler, if I'm saying it right, came in with the lowest bid at $19,916.50 uh, however, uh, they did not bid on one of the items in the, spec in the specifications, which is a specific type of full frame uh, rifle made by Sig Sauer versus the smaller frame uh, rifle that they sell that's made by uh, a company called Springfield. Uh, as such, the recommendation uh, being made this evening would be to award the purchase of rifles and equipment to both uh, Keesler Police Supply and CMP distributors because CMP distributors does provide uh, for the different piece of equipment uh, that the Keisler dealer doesn't. Uh, as you'll see in the communication of the department uh, is looking for an award tonight of the 19,600, uh, uh, excuse me, $19,916.50 uh, and to CMP distributors in an amount of $1,698. Uh, funds are available in the police department budget for this purchase in this fiscal year. Additionally, uh, in accordance with our COVID-19 financial response plan, uh, these funds were not frozen uh, for the police department or the fire department. Uh, specifically, as the plan um, uh, advises, the response plan maintains police and fire related projects because deferring these purchases could negatively impact the, the city's ability to respond to public safety emergencies with the most up-to-date tools available. Uh, the purchase price I will uh, uh, advise is slightly higher than what the budgeted amount was. Uh, the budgeted amount for the, per for the purchase was 15,000, but again, uh, we do have the funds available for the total purchase price, which would be 21,614 and 50 cents. Uh, I'm going to now defer to our public safety director, Adam Ajepka, just to talk a little bit about the purpose of having uh, these tools in the police department. Uh, Adam? Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, uh, Mayor and members of council. Um, I guess I'll uh, go back. When I, when I started, <clears throat> uh, after inventorying some of the equipment, I noticed uh, some shortfalls that, that we may have had and some changes that, uh, that I felt was uh, important to make. Um, one of those things was we, we had some equipment in, uh, our, um, in our possession from the LISO program um, that I did not feel the need to uh, continue to keep. Um, those items were returned. Um, I also identified that uh, that our patrol rifles were aged um, over 10 years old. Um, when you do the training and the MCOS qualifications, um, certain things can go wrong with those rifles. Um, you have the ability of shooting out the rifling inside the barrels. Um, that caused uh, accuracy issues. Um, Basically, I, I want to kind of go over this real quick. Um, handguns are typically a defensive tool, um, allowing accuracy up to about 25 <coughs> Um In today's day and age and what we're seeing um, across the country is some pretty disturbing trends, such as active shooters in schools, where the yardage would definitely exceed 25 yards. Um, 
rifles are typically just deployed for threats where potential ranges are exceeding that 25 yards, such as active shooters in the schools, wooded trains, open fields, barricaded suspects and residences. Um, patrol rifles are definitely more accurate than the handguns, and uh, they're deployed across the nation with uh, throughout law enforcement. Um, this is actually just a housekeeping. Um, we're getting rid of the old aged equipment and we're replacing it with newer, more modern, up-to-date equipment. Um, over time, due to training and using the rifles every year out on the range, the rifling can wear out, the springs can stretch and break, internal parts become worn and diminished. And this program um, actually allows the officers to be individually assigned their own rifle owned by the city. These are semi-automatic patrol rifles. They do not have the capability of going into full auto, um, which is what uh, the officers are trained at the academy to utilize and uh, here at Cadillac Police Department. If anybody has any questions, I'm, I, I'm open for answering those. Adam, Ellen Moss here. How many years can we get out of these rifles? What do you think? Um, well, so if we're using, you know, if we're shooting a thousand yep. rounds a year in a training, that means we're dumping 10,000 rounds down the barrel. Um, depending, they've, they've come a long way. There's the chrome line barrels. Um, there's, uh, some different, um, uh, treatments that they put in the barrels to get longer lasting, um, barrels. But, um, I would say. 10 years would probably be a good a good time to look at replacing those. We also have two members um, that are part of Northern Michigan Mutual Aid. And I'm going to assume that, and I'm not just going to assume, I know that when they go out and train, they're putting several thousand rounds that, through those barrels. Um, additionally, on top of, you know, the, the MCOL's qualifications for the other officers. <laughs> Seven seventeen hundred seems like a lot for a rifle, but it's a pretty high tech piece of equipment, isn't it? Yeah. So this is not just the rifles; it's also the optics and slings. It's it's um, all of the accessories that come along with them. Um, part of the issue um, that you run into with the patrol rifles that I've seen in my experience. Uh, by the way, let me kind of just give you a background. I was the firearms instructor um, for the city of Marshall. I've uh, been through MSP's uh, firearm instructor school. Um, I'm very well versed um, with the uh, the firearms. Um, but what what I'll say is that the issues that you can run into is everybody gets sighted in on the optics, whether it be iron sights or even scopes or um, red dots to their person and their shooting position, their platform. Um, a lot of times when they're, when they're, if they're not assigned to the individual officers, they go out to the range, they'll adjust for themselves. And that may throw off the accuracy for the next officer to pick up that rifle. So by issuing the rifles to the individual officers, we're guaranteeing that they're going to maintain the, the rifle. They're going to keep the optics set up for their, that individual officer and that's how it's going to be deployed when they're working. And they're stored in the police station. Correct. They'll be they'll be they'll be maintained at the the police department. Okay. Um, it, um, yes, and and they'll be taking them with them on patrol. Thank you. Yes, sir. If there's no more discussion, would someone like to make a motion? I'd make a motion to award the purchase of police rifles to Keisler Police Supply in the amount of $19,960.50 and CMP distributors in the amount of $1,698. Ellen Moss. I'll support. This is Ingalls. Councilmember King. <coughs> yes. yes. Shippers. Yes. Alamba? Jesus. Ingles? Yes. Air Falcon? Yes. 
<laughs> Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Council member of shippers, are you okay over there? <laughs> so well, I get a new device, you know, where do you unmute on the, on the new device? So I got it. <laughs> um, well, thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, uh, the next item uh, is regarding uh, the Chamber of Commerce Leadership Class Project Concepts. Uh, I don't know how many concepts the leadership class is going to be contemplating. However, there are a couple of concepts that are before them currently. Uh, and before uh, the class gets too far down the road, I wanted to take a moment uh, and just brief the city council and, and frankly get, uh, uh, get support. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll pull them. Uh, the one uh, concept in front of the class currently uh, is one that the Downtown Development Authority or our DDA has been, has been sort of working on uh, off and on again over the last few years. Uh, and that's with respect to the uh, uh, potential future installation of what they're calling uh, protected crosswalks. They would be uh, uh, within uh, the Mitchell Street right of way, uh, one north of Spruce Street, uh, one south of Beach Street. Uh, this is a project that uh, actually MDOT brought to our attention a number of years ago and mentioned that there may be some, uh, some potential funding even to help make it work. Uh, and, and nothing ever really materialized from that, uh, which certainly still requires some form of local support, most likely in the form of, of funding. Uh, and so the thought was, well, if we could, if we could try to package something together, uh, maybe there would be the ability of, of moving it forward. And as you'll see in the communication, uh, there's a conceptual um, uh, rendering of, of the location of it, or, or what it is, I should say, plus a, an actual picture of exactly what these things are as they, they live currently in Detroit, um, right, right across from Little uh, Caesars Arena. Uh, another project that the leadership class uh, also has uh, sort of in their, in their basket to look at uh, includes uh, a potential installation of a new roof over the Shea locomotive in the city park. Uh, this is a project also that uh, has been talked about from time to time. There's, uh, I believe they're anonymous currently, uh, uh, potential donors uh, that are looking at maybe investing and helping to pay to, to re-roof uh, that structure. Uh, and the thought would be perhaps if that's something that the leadership class would like to, to be able to help get behind, that that could be a, a, good, a good opportunity. Uh, another project that's not in their hopper uh, but is one that was contemplated several years ago, was actually helping to, to fundraise for the uh, uh, trailhead, the White Pine uh, uh, Trailhead project. And uh, even though it's not in the communication, I wanted to mention that perhaps as council considers, uh, considers this this evening, to add into the recommendation, uh, maybe just some, some small verbiage to also include that project uh, should that one come up and be something that they want to maybe focus on as well, that way we also have it on the record in a sense that that council would be supportive. Um, and that's that's it. John Wallace, our development director, is is on the line, uh, and I believe uh, Caitlin uh, Beard uh, with the chamber is also on the line. But uh, I don't have anything further to add at this time. This is Council Member King. The one project with the protected crosswalks on Mitchell is one that worries me because I remember the conversations before about the effect that would have on plowing in the winter, uh, impossible uh, obstruction that's added to our bump outs, which cause a challenge already for um, uh, for our plowing. I'm, I'm all in favor of identifying crosswalks and uh, giving pedestrians a right of way, but I'm not sure I want to support a project that would actually try to put a boulevard or another obstruction on Mitchell. The, um, and you might be right on that council member. I will advise that public works is aware um, and they haven't raised any issues uh, to my knowledge. Uh, about about it from an operational perspective. Um, no, one, no one thought the bump outs would be a problem either. Yeah. And those have been a real challenge. Those weren't identified ahead of time. Uh, 
Okay, if there's no further discussion, would someone like to make a motion? Um, <clears throat> I think I think I would agree with Steve on the on the road thing. Actually, I think I, um, I'd like to make a motion, uh, slightly changing our support here for um, White Pine Trailhead donations and for the roof over the Shea. Um, should the leader uh, leadership class choose one of those for the project? I I would support that motion. This is Steve King. Council Member Shippers? Yes. Ellen Boss? Yes. Ingalls? Yes. King? Yes. Mayor Fokins? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, moving right along, and thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, uh, just a brief COVID 19 update tonight. Uh, as of uh, a little bit earlier this afternoon, the District Health Department number 10 has reported uh, a total of 2,047 cases for their uh, area that they represent. Uh, currently, uh, 30 total deaths. Uh, there are um, uh, 128 uh, positive cases in Wexford County currently with a total of four deaths. Uh, within the, uh, uh, the District 10 region, there's been 1,441 total recoveries, uh, with 98 being attributed to Wexford County. Uh, and as always, please visit uh, www.dhd10.org for um, many more details that they have and graphs. It's pretty interesting how they're tracking everything. So um, that uh, ends the city manager's report uh, this evening. Marcus, might you also want to share what was decided um, in Lansing about virtual meetings? They're allowed. <laughs> so um, I think that's uh, and it's a great update. I know that there was some uh, conversation at our last city council meeting uh, that the city attorney uh, helped to facilitate. Uh, and since then, the governor, uh, I believe just late last week, signed into law uh, changes to the Open Meetings Act that, mm -hmm. that does allow through the end of the calendar year uh, uh, public bodies to continue to meet in this full manner uh, and then allows uh, through uh, the following year uh, for people to still join virtually um, uh, if they meet certain criteria. I don't have um, that list in front of me and, and I know that the city attorney is on the line. I'm not sure if he has that in front of him either. Uh, but um, unless something changes, my assumption is that uh, we would be, uh, uh, be meeting again uh, in January in person uh, unless somebody needs to meet remotely. That will uh, pose perhaps a little bit of a, of a complication because it'll require some kind of a hybrid manner, but you could call in, uh, which might be easier. Uh, and we still have talked about maybe even trying to meet yet in the farmer's market uh, pending uh, if we're ready to roll with, with some of the um, uh, trailhead updates uh, in, at your meeting in November. But whether or not we have that information ready and whether or not uh, the weather will, will allow us to do that are still a couple of questions that are, that are up in the air. Mike, were you going to say something? I was just going to add that um, so... The governor signed uh, Senate Bill 1108 for, uh, late Friday afternoon. Um, what the amendments do is they um, make the changes to the Open Meetings Act retroactive back to middle of March. Um, and then through the end of this calendar year, the city um, public bodies uh, can meet for any reason um, by way of uh, video conference or telephone conference anything that uh, is uh, two-way transmission to allow the public to, to participate. Um, after January 1st of uh, 2020, those circumstances are narrowed uh, in terms of attending meetings, and those are limited to um, military duty, a medical condition, or a statewide or local state of emergency or disaster. So uh, medical condition is defined um, under the act uh, what's unclear to me is, I suppose, whether or not um, a medical condition could be um, 
say, for example, um, inclusion within a vulnerable, say, age group or somebody with underlying medical uh, conditions that uh, would put them at risk for COVID. So I, I think some of those issues we're going to have to um, work our way through. Um, but I will give you uh, another important thing I think is important. Uh, I didn't believe that meeting virtually under the Open Meetings Act was a violation of the act to begin with. Um, nonetheless, um, because of the manner in which the amendments were made, that unless you have um, you're on leave for, say, military duty, or you have a medical condition, or there's a statewide or local state of emergency or disaster, you are now precluded from attending a meeting by virtual means. So for example, if you happen to be out of state, say on vacation, you can no longer participate in an electronic meeting uh, from a remote location unless you qualify for one of those uh, categories. So, and that is a change um, certainly to the act. So. Uh, just keep that in mind. We'll, we'll probably be working through those issues um, uh, later this year as well into next to see what is going on. So, for, for instance, there are local states of emergency that are still declared throughout regions uh, of the state related to COVID. Um, some of my clients have declared local emergencies, so um, those would allow the public bodies to continue to meet um, by electronic means. And, you know, whatever you may think, certainly uh, in-person meeting is uh, better than, than uh, video, but um, I can make a pretty good argument as well that uh, the virtual meetings have actually increased public participation in many instances as well. So, I, you know, the whole um, issue hopefully will get resolved um, soon, but it may be a while before we get back together. And I think you, we're going to have to play it by ear with cases that are on the rise and what that means for individual, not only council members, but members of the public as well. I have a question. I was listening to the MML thing this morning and then reading um, through the bill. What about the part where we have to announce like where we're at? Does, does that part not take effect yet? Were we supposed to have done that at the start of this meeting? No, um, so because the uh, you can meet for any purpose up until the end of the calendar year, I read that provision that only on a going forward basis under one of those qualifying conditions where you may have to do that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, Mike, that would be after January 1, right? C correct. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, Mike, if you're still there, I think we're at the, the point now where we're going to be having Council consider the setting of the public hearings in regard to both the recreational and medical marijuana re related tweaks to the ordinance. If you could perhaps in one sort of fell swoop uh, give that quick update regarding the timing and then the ability of, of setting the, the clock for the other categories for applications. Sure. So uh, we've um, provided to the city uh, two resolutions, one amending um, or setting a public hearing for proposed recreational marijuana uh, amendments uh, to your existing ordinance, the other for the medical. Um, both of them do the same thing. And so uh, the, these amendments were necessary for two reasons, really. Uh, the first um, and more important, I suppose, was to extend the time for submitting paperwork for the establishment and specific step of the application for a state operating license to LARA. Um, LARA changed its uh, processes somewhat during the time period during which we considered and adopted the um, city's ordinances until now. And so LARA is not going to accept applications until the premises are ready to be occupied. So what this um, proposed amendment would do would be to change the timeline. The original timeline provided for 30 days, that is 30 days after the city awarded conditional authorization, the applicant had to submit their step two application to LARA. 
but because Lara changed the manner in which they're receiving those, they won't even accept those step two applications, which would mean the applicant uh, would run afoul of that 30 day limitation under our ordinance. What the proposed amendment will do is to extend that to be 60 days after receipt of the certificate of occupancy for the establishment, then they would have to file for that step two application process with Lara. And in that case, there should not be a timing issue um, absent any other changes by the state. The second um, amendment is to allow the city manager to periodically and administratively open a new receipt period and establish deadlines for applications, but only for those establishments for which licenses remain available. A good um, example of that is uh, growers uh, grower license. Uh, the city did not have any applications for growers um, license and therefore it remains unfilled. And so we would, without this amendment, we would have to come back to city council to get that reopened and so this is going to uh, ease that process by allowing the city manager administratively to open up that um, application acceptance uh, process for a period of not less than 30 days so that you can gauge the interest in filling those uh, unfilled uh, licenses uh, that remain at the city. So the amendment is the same in both, but they're different uh, ordinances. So they're proposed in two different resolutions and ordinance amendments. Does anyone have any questions? And if not, would someone like to make a motion? Does council member shippers, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I will make a motion to adopt a resolution to introduce ordinance to amend section 10-2 of chapter 10 of this Cadillac City Code, Recreational Marijuana re Establishments, and set a public hearing for November 16th. I would second that, Ellen Boss. Council Member Ellen Boss? Yes. Ingalls? Yes. King? Yes. Shippers? Yes. Mayor Fokin? Yes, motion carries. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. The next item is, is the same with respect to what you just heard the City Attorney present on. Uh, this one is for medical marijuana, and the request is to set uh, the public hearing accordingly for, again, your next meeting, uh, Monday, November 16th. Council Member Shippers again. Um, I will make the motion to adopt resolution to introduce ordinance to amend Section 10-3 of Chapter 10 of the Cadillac City Code Medical Marijuana Facilities and set a public hearing for November 16th, 2020. Ellen, I second that. Council Member Ingalls? Yes. King? Yes. Shippers? Yes. Ellen Boss? Yes. Mayor Fulkin? Yes, motion carries. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, moving along to the next section of the agenda under adoption of ordinances and resolutions, uh, we have uh, a couple that includes the, the one that was added uh, earlier this evening. Uh, the first one is with respect to uh, consideration of a MDOT contract. Uh, this is a contract for phase two construction of Chestnut Street. Uh, MDOT facilitates uh, essentially the entire process, all the bidding and contracting for the project uh, and the utilization of the small urban grant uh, that the city received to help pay for the project. Uh, our city engineer is on as well as our finance director if there are any detailed questions. This I believe is the last step um, that council would be involved in with regard to the future phase two construction that should be I believe starting um, sometime later this summer after school that's out the 21. I know that um, we are, uh, I know this, but I'm not sure everybody is aware, but this is why we were waiting to finish the rest of uh, Chestnut Street, right? I know 
Um, if Owen, if you could just highlight that that quick for a couple seconds about what we yeah, did good last, point. what we did last year and um, yep. how how we got the money now for the rest of it, so we didn't have to wait. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so we were looking at having to wait until next summer to do the whole thing. And we didn't want to go another winter with the east portion was the worst. And so we, um, in, cons in consult with, with uh, our engineer, uh, we're confident that we could split it up into two parts and do the first part now so that we wouldn't have to face another winter and then pothole season in the spring with the worst east, east section of chestnut. So we have that done now, obviously. And then the, the remainder of it is is Colfax down to Leeson. And that um, we did in fact get um, within a couple thousand dollars of maximizing those grant funds of 375. Typically there's an, an ad or two that, that I think will bring us right up into using a hundred percent of the grant dollars. So um, we did it in two phases so that we could get the worst part done quick. And this is the final phase where we can use 100% of the grant funds, hopefully 375,000. Um, right now, the contract says 359, um, and that gives us some flex if there's some some additional costs. So Marcus pointed out real quick too that um, this is not one that we bid out and that we award. Uh, this would be uh, council's only action on the project because it's an MDOT contract. Uh, what we have to do is approve the contract and assign our engineer to work on the project, but they handle the bidding award and all of the contract stuff with the actual contractor. Thank you, Owen. Are there any other questions? All right, I'll make a motion to adopt the, oh wait, I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution approving MDOT contract 20-5387 uh, for Chestnut Street project. I'll second that, Ellen Boss. Council Member King? Yes. Shippers? Yes. Ellen Boss? Yes. Ingalls? Yes. Mayor Falcons? Yes, motion carries. Thank you, um, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, the uh, uh, final item uh, under this section has to deal with the item that we added this, uh, this afternoon, uh, and it's the request to consider a resolution increasing the number of members from eight to nine on the Corridor Improvement Authority Board for Cadillac West. Uh, City Attorney and I uh, were, were talking about this uh, the other day Neither one of us are really quite sure how we ended up with uh, with an even uh, number of members. It may have had something to do possibly with the way the original resolution was drafted, where it refers to um, uh, the, the mayor or her designee. And then I think it even said in parentheticals, possibly city manager, and maybe it was double counted or something. And, and we thought we ended up with an odd number, but in reality, we didn't. We ended up with an even number. So this evening, uh, we're looking at, at resolving that. Uh, we actually have uh, somebody that's, that's also indicated some interest uh, as well. So I would anticipate uh, possibly having um, uh, a, uh, an application uh, for consideration at your next meeting in November accordingly. And then we'll actually have a full nine member board. Uh, the action this evening would, uh, again, in short, increase it from eight to nine and would allow for the ability for an additional member to be uh, on the board that either lives within the area or within a half mile uh, of the corridor as that classification already currently exists. <coughs> All right, that makes sense too. Um, should I make a motion or is that okay? All right, so I will make a motion to adopt the resolution increasing the number of members to the Corridor Improvement Authority Board. I'll, I'll second that, Ellen Boss. Council Member Shippers? Yes. Ellen Boss? Yes. Ingalls? Yes. King? Yes. Mayor Falcons? Yes, motion carries. 
Okay, so this evening in our packet, we do have the minutes uh, of the last Historic Districts Commission meeting, and that was held in July. And at this time, we'll open the floor for our second public comment this evening. Seeing and hearing no one, we'll close public comment and move to the good of the order. If anyone has anything this evening. Um, council member shippers, I do. Um, I would just like to, I, I understand that Joy Van Dree is taking a position other than um, heading up the Visitors Bureau. And I would just like to thank her for all her years of service and for the excellent job that she's done um, with the Visitors Bureau and promoting our beautiful city and helping keep all the wonderful things that we do in the eyes of the public. So thank you, Joy, and good luck. We're sorry to lose you, and they're lucky to gain you. I would agree with that. And also with Halloween coming up, I hope everyone has a safe Halloween, meaning this, wear your masks, or yeah. this mask. <laughs> well, you know. You come to this guy's door without a mask on, grumpy old man's not giving you any candy. There you go. I finally know who you are, you mask barrier. Now you see a guy on a bike wearing that hat, wearing that hat. Anyway, have a good Halloween, young people, you only young ones. Thank you. Marcus, do you want to talk about um, Halloween? I know you put out a, a press thing about it, but do you want to talk about Halloween protocol for folks? Uh -huh. Sure, if you give me a moment, I'll pull Sorry, up. Sorry, I put you on the spot. It's okay. I just need to uh, go to our website. Um, oh, you can find it on the website? It's on our website, uh, right <laughs> under news and announcements. It's also on our uh, Facebook site as well. Uh, Halloween 2020 guidelines and guidance. And it is uh, a link that you would click that then takes you to a landing page with another link that will take you to a uh, place where you could view the three-page document or you can download it into Adobe or print it. Uh, our guidelines have, have basically stayed the same as they've been um, over the last number of years. Uh, I think it's important to first of all mention that the city is not in, uh, the city doesn't, doesn't organize or pick a date or set anything official. Halloween is on October 31st. Uh, every year, and whether that's a Monday, Tuesday, or a Friday or Saturday, it, I mean, Halloween is on Halloween. Uh, these are just simple, you know, sort of common sense tips and tricks for trick or treaters and for parents and guardians. Uh, and it looks like uh, Owen, I think, just put that on the uh, on the website, so or on our meeting site. So thank you. Um, uh, we've we're kindly asking uh, for trick or treaters to. Uh, perhaps uh, trick or treat between 4 and 8 p.m. Uh, and then this year we have also included, starting on the second page, Owen, if you could just scroll down, uh, the guidance from our district health department number 10 uh, that includes essentially their tips uh, in the age of, uh, of COVID-19 uh, about what you should be doing as a trick or treater. And so it's all uh, I think uh, really easily laid out. It's bullet. It's bullet pointed, as you can see, uh, and we have uh, uh, issued a, a release, you know, to all the media, and are encouraging people to take a look at this before they head out this year. Hopefully, the weather will hold, and we'll have uh, have some good fun. I got to give Mike credit for that, Marcus. Mike was doing that. Doing what? Oh, home here. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Listen, I, I, I was a little concerned about the tips when you uh, read the tips for homeowners on Halloween, and it starts out with, use duct tape. You got to look at the context. You guys, sorry, the rest of that is to mark six-foot lines. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh. oh, so. All right, thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Is there anything else this evening? If not, thank you, everyone. And we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Bye. Bye.